Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains Turk, and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today, we're speaking with a 51 year old mom to two teenagers who worked as a national sales manager for 23 years up until. Some COVID layoffs happened, which inspired her to launch her lifestyle coaching business, which I love the name of this. It's Holistic Nutrition. She's traveled to 45 countries, earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and her MBA from CU Boulder. She started bodybuilding at 48 and just turned pro at 50 years old in two of her classes. And I'm so excited to have her on because we got to meet at my build more than just a body live event this, you know, just this past month, actually in August. And after hearing some of her story, I asked her to come onto the show. So I'm really happy to have her. Welcome to the podcast, Holly Larson. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much, Celeste. Thanks so much for having me today. Of course, it is my pleasure. And before we get into everything, I got to know if there's something you do or think about right before your heel hits the stage. Oh gosh. Um, for me, it's all about trying to relax. It's all about trying to calm my nerves, which is actually <laughs> kind of how I feel right now. I've got that same adrenaline rush right now um, <laughs> as if I was getting on stage. Um, and it's for me, I love the training and nutrition of bodybuilding and I'm, I'm learning to love the stage. Um, I feel like for a lot of people, it's the opposite. They love that stage. They love to get up there and shine. Um, and for me, that's the hardest part. Oh yeah. I I can understand that. I think also the whole day is long and then you get up on stage and it's finally your time and it goes by so fast. And I know your past year, like you've mentioned, it is the training and nutrition that comes more naturally for you. Whereas posing doesn't, and you worked really hard on that. And I was actually curious what you did over the past couple of years to really bring your posing and presentation to, to develop that comfort up there. Right. Um, yeah, posing is definitely the hardest part. Um, heels, <laughs> five inch heels alone is enough to uh, make me reconsider the sport. Um, I'm a gym shoes. Yeah, I'm a gym shoes and flip flops kind of girl. So wearing five inch heels, um, that was very intimidating, not to mention in, you know, this itty bitty teeny bikini. Yeah. Um, so I would say lots of group posing lessons and then lots of one on one posing lessons. Um, and then it's, it's a whole different ball game when you go from amateur to pro because amateur, you get up there, you hit your couple of poses and you're done. Pro routines can be over a minute long. Um, so that, that added a whole another interesting element to it for me. How did you change your routine when you made your pro debut? Um, really, you know, it's the same type of poses, but you just have to add in a lot more walking and I'd say a lot more personality. Um, you know, just more arm movements, a little more sass, a little more hair flip kind of stuff like that. Um, but the core poses I would say are pretty much the same. Definitely. I, I think it too, there are some pros who don't do very long routines, you know, like I think Janet does a long routine and then Issa longer routine and you, you've got these girls who do longer routines, but there's still girls who are very successful with shorter routines. Like I think of Jen Dory, it's, it's, um, beautiful and elegant, but not super long, you know, not a lot of frills. So, um, I think it's, it's cool that we get to bring our own personality at that level. And of course at the NPC too, but it's just different when you see girls on the IFBB stages bringing it. Yeah. And I totally agree. And to me, the, the pros, they don't look nervous. So if they are they're they've mastered it and they're (laughs) hiding it really well. Um, but I went to a posing seminar over the summer uh, with Sandy and something I'll never forget is she said, the longer you're on stage, the more time we have to see your flaws. Yes. So get up there, do your routine and get, get it done. Um, so that one sticks with me. And I, I definitely err on the shorter routine side. Definitely. And like practicing, at least my coach, as I've gotten into this more, she's like practice more than one, you know, especially for, um, and as an amateur who has 
experience on stage she's like you can get away with having like two different routines and then deciding based on how are you looking going into that show because you know if you have like a step back to to turn and face the judges again and maybe your hamstrings aren't as conditioned as you needed them to be or maybe uh, you don't feel as comfortable doing that because the show's going fast you want to always be able to have something else that you can throw in obviously you want to be ready for your show but um, I think it's good to just be comfortable in heels and in posing. And um, it, that was my weakest point. And it seems that it's always evolving, which I think is actually really cool. And Sandy always has those great points about, you know, don't, don't take too long up there. Cause we're not, everyone looks amazing. We're going to look for what doesn't really. Um, right. But I wanted to go back to when you first started competing in the first place. So you, you hired a high level coach, um, and, and you got encouraged to do this sport and you loved it and you got your pro card and, and all of this unfolded, but how did you even find bodybuilding? Yeah, it's actually kind of a summer, uh, kind of a funny story. <laughs> so it was the summer of 2018 and a friend of mine has a, a happiness business. Um, she's in the business of helping people become more happy. And um, she also has a group called the Badass Mom Society, and she's just a total entrepreneur. She does lots of cool stuff. But she had this women's retreat. And I just said, you know what? I don't have anything going on. I'm going to go check it out, see what I can learn. And one of the activities was goal setting. And I decided at that event that my goal would be to get in the best shape of my life at 48 years old. Um, and of course, being an accountability group, the women were like, well, how are you going to do that? You can't just say you're going to do it. How are you going to do it? And I said, well, I don't know. Do you guys have any ideas? I've, you know, kind of exercised and done sports my whole life and I'm not where I need to be. And somebody suggested a bikini show. And I said, oh, that sounds kind of fun. Cool. I'll look into it. That's how I'm going to do it. And I honestly knew nothing about it. I didn't know it was even called bodybuilding. Um, so I came back from the retreat and I started re researching bikini shows and bikini coaches. And I totally lucked out that Adam Bonilla and Team Elite Physique happened to be in Denver, so only about half hour away from me. And I called Adam and I, you know, read about his, read on his site what he did and all that. And then I called him and said, "Hi, I want to do a bikini show in two months." And he just laughed and said, "Are you just in phenomenal shape? Like you're you know, really in amazing shape?" And I said, "Well, no. Why?" And he said because the sport takes years. He's like, people don't get on stage in two months. He's like, six months is about the shortest that I'd take anybody. And that's assuming that you're pretty fit. And I said, well, I'm pretty fit, but can we do five months? <laughs> I said, I want to get done before the holidays. He said, all right, five months. So signed on with him. Um, it was definitely a lot more than I ever anticipated or expected. Um, the nutrition was more strict. The training was harder, um, but I really enjoyed it. And I did my first show. It was a, a local show in Colorado um, that December. And I actually won my age group. And then I won the Masters overall. So I was kind of blown away. I certainly wasn't expecting to win. Um, but I had accomplished my goal. I was in the best shape of my life. So I was done. Um, so I took the next year off. And I really, really missed it. <laughs> I missed having a reason to train. I missed having a reason to eat clean. Um, and although the stage terrified me, um, I kind of missed having that carrot hanging out there for me. Um, so by December of the following year, I had convinced two of my kind of gym rat friends to do a, com to do a competition with me. And um, they both signed up for Team Elite Physique. One of them was a 35-year-old mom and the other was a 64-year-old retired guy. Wow. And um, so, we, yeah, we all signed up. The three of us we were going to train together. We we're going to do a show together six months later in May. And then boom, COVID happened. Yeah. Oh, geez. So, you know, like everyone else, life was delayed and postponed and different and changed. Um, our, our May show, we were going to do the mile high in Denver was canceled. Um, and we all kind of just had to do the best we could in our basements and things like that. Um, so I didn't know when I was going to compete next. It had been, the six months that I had wanted to do was over. And then I just saw that um, Adam had posted on his site, hey, there's a show in Vegas next weekend. If anyone is <laughs> stayed ready, come on out because this show is going to happen. Um, so I said, I'm in. You know, I've done all this training. I'm ready. I want to do it. Um, so that's a whole nother crazy story. We could do a whole nother podcast on that. But um, Was that the one that ended up in a hookah lounge? Yes. 
I was at the show that ended up in a hookah lounge because talk Vegas about it. No one's, no one's been on the show and talked about it yet. So talk about oh it God. because this is a good story. Oh <laughs> it was so crazy. It was so crazy. So I forget if it was June or July, but it was June or July, 2020. So just the middle of COVID um, we were supposed to have this show. It was a muscle contest show mm -hmm. at, I think it was called Alexis park. And literally the morning the morning of the show. So we had our hair, we had our makeup, we had our tan, first coat of tan done. The morning of the show, we get a call or a text. Everyone got text saying, the show's been canceled. We can't have it at this hotel. We're looking for a new place to have it. And you're just like, oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. So um, I do totally uh, commend the promoters for, you know, yes. they found out, I think it was like midnight the night before. So they spent the whole night trying to find out where can we host the show? Like, where can we set up a stage and get in here and um, actually host the show? And they did. They found this hookah lounge. Um, it was crazy. It was really, it was really small. Um, but the stage fit and all the competitors, because of COVID, we had to wait outside. And I think it was like 113 degrees that day. So we're all outside trying not to sweat in our bikinis and our tans. We never did get our second layer of tan. I'm not sure what happened there, but, um, and they managed to, they managed to get almost the entire show in and done like as fast and crazy as possible. I actually missed one of my classes because you, you couldn't really hear it and it was pretty chaotic. Um, but they got the whole, almost the whole show done before apparently some like neighboring business called the cops on them. Jeez. So it was, it was crazy. So that was my second show. <laughs> Aye, aye, aye. Oh, I just want to make yeah. a comment on that really quick. Um, I think it was amazing to see that happen because I had talked to a friend who was doing that show. Her name's Katie. And she told me what happened. And I was like, you're kidding me. Like, this is crazy, you know? And on one hand, you want to be like, wow, I didn't get the full experience I wanted. And on the other hand, you're like, oh my gosh, the links that the NPC and these promoters and muscle contests went through just so that us competitors could have our experience and show our hard work and dedication. Like I, I think that's really amazing and a testament to the idea that the stage will always be there. Like they're literally doing everything they can to make shows happen and, and during a crazy time. So it'll, it'll always be there. And I just love that story. And I appreciate you uh, sharing your experience with that specific situation with us, because um, I think it, again, it goes to show that if you, if you want something and the promoters want something in this sport and this league, they really do everything they can for the athletes. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was really impressive. The, the lengths that they went to make it happen. Um, everyone was really appreciative and grateful because, you know, once you've trained for so long and you've gotten your tan, you've gotten your hair done and, you know, you've flown all the way to Vegas to have it just canceled is, it's pretty devastating. You know, it's devastating to have a show canceled anytime, but after you're already there and thinking you're going to walk on stage in a few hours to then have it canceled is like, come on, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, please don't do this. So it was, it was fantastic. And I will say it's definitely my most memorable show because it was so crazy. Um, so that actually makes it kind of fun there too. Um, and then I'll continue the journey. So my next show was shortly thereafter. It was a Colorado state show. Um, and that was in August also in, in Denver. Um, and that was a weird one because it was masks on stage the whole time. Um, it was prejudging and finals immediately after each other versus the whole, you know, long mm -hmm. delay between the morning and the night show, which I actually kind of loved. I love that. Um, yes. Yeah. And then, um, so I had won that show too in my, in my age and I'd won the Vegas show too in my age. So after that show, Adam basically said, you need some national competition. <laughs> um, he said, this is this local stuff too easy. You need to go to the teen collegiate masters nationals um, in five weeks. I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> did you know what that was? Like, did you, at that point, did no. you know what a pro card was or anything? I, I, I mean, I kind of knew that people wanted pro cards and I knew I had no idea how you got a pro card. Um, I just, I did, it wasn't even something I was thinking about. It wasn't something that I dreamed about. It wasn't within my, even within my realm, other than I knew it was something part of the sport, you know? Um, I didn't know how you want it even. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. So this TCM Nationals was in Orlando. Um, and I decided, actually, it was pretty good advice. A friend of mine, just a Facebook friend, said, make sure you do more than just your class. And I said, well, I'm 50 now. Why would I want to compete against a 45 or a 40-year-old? And she said, because you never know who's going to show up that day. She said, you might not win in 50, but you might win in 40 just based on who yeah. shows up. Um, well, as you know, these shows are pretty expensive and I don't love being on stage. So I decided to do two groups. I did the 50 and the 45. Um, and again, to my shock and dismay, I actually won my class um, for both of those. So <laughs> I, sent, awesome. I sent a picture home to Adam. I said, look, double pro card. He's like, oh, don't advertise that because one of the girls in one of the classes is going to be mad that you got two. <laughs> Someone else I, think, had it. I thought like, that oh. they give it to the second place and or the yeah, I thought they give it to the second place anyways. No, at this show, it was only first place. Wow. But I, for some reason, I thought even if like if first place had already won their pro card, I thought that they just defaulted to the second. So I didn't know that. Yeah, no, they didn't. And um because afterwards she's like, did you, did you really have to go out there again? I'm like, well, what was I supposed to do? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Name of the game. Exactly. So that was last fall. And then I, I was like, well, now what? Um, well, I wasn't expecting that. And um, Adam said, well, the pro girls are a lot bigger than you. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm not super tall, but I'm five, seven and a half. And on the more kind of tall and lean ectomorph side. Um, so for me, the challenge is building muscle, especially at my age. Um, not to say it can't be done, it's definitely been growing, but it's slow. Um, and so I took the next eight months to grow and build and train and <laughs> learn a pro routine. Um, and then again, my, my pro debut was another weird one because it was the Puerto Rico pro, uh, yes. which actually took place in the Bahamas. <laughs> that's so um, weird yeah and and it was a hard show to get to so it was definitely a smaller show I mean you obviously had to you had to be COVID tested before you had to be COVID tested after your fifth day in the Bahamas you not only had to have a passport to get there but you also had to have a travel visa to get in the, the Bahamas really so it was definitely, oh yeah it was a how long did production. it take you to get that the travel visa um you know I probably did it a month or two in advance but um it's, it was just an online thing. Wow. I, I why, did, could, yeah, why did you want to do that really one? Um, so there's no master's pro shows in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And my thought is if I have to travel, I might as well travel somewhere fun. Yeah. Um, and I love, I love warm weather. I love beaches. Um, I've been to the Bahamas, but it has been many years ago. And um, so I don't know, that one just jumped out at me as just a fun place. I love to travel. So kind of turned it into a little bit. Clearly too. you've been to freaking 45 countries. <laughs> That's amazing. I tell you, it, yeah, I love to travel. It's definitely one of my passions. Yeah, no, me too. I, I was blessed with parents who took me traveling as a young child slash girl and, and into my teen years. And man, I feel so blessed that they instilled that in me and that I got to see so many incredible places. And, and now it's like, I see that the world is so beautiful and endless and the people are beautiful and endless and it's, it's really special. And actually while we're on the subject, what's your favorite place you've ever been to, or maybe a couple of your favorites? Oh, that's funny. I was going to ask you the same. <laughs> um, my, my very favorite is Kenya. Um, really? It about three, yeah. It was about three years ago. And I took the, my husband, and I took our kids on um, a safari and the Maasai Mara and it was just unbelievable. Um, we were there for two weeks and um, just traveled throughout Kenya, and it was it was just it was just spectacular. And um, I'd been to Africa a few times before. I'd been to Morocco and Egypt and Northern Africa, um, and we had been to Cape Town and um, Southern Africa before too. Um, and we loved all of them. Don't get me wrong. Like yes. I'd, yeah. I'd go back to all of them in the heartbeat, except for there's too many other places I haven't seen yet. But Kenya was just, it was just magical. Um, it's, it's hard to even describe other than like when we did safari in South Africa, you'd, you'd go for about you know, 20, 30 minutes and then you'd see some animals. And it was really hard to find the animals and you'd have a spotter who would help find the animals. 
um, in Kenya, everywhere you looked, I mean, it seemed like there were millions of animals and they were all intermingled, you know, the giraffes were with the, the wild beast and the elephants wow. were with the other ones. And it's just, I mean, almost like Lion King, you know, I mean, it sounds yeah. kind of funny, but it was, it was pretty magical. So that's, that's that was definitely my favorite. Where is your favorite place you've ever been? Um, well, Fiji and Finland. So Fiji, I've been blessed to go twice. I went as a young girl and then again, again, closer to my teen years. And the people there are so phenomenal and kind. And the views are beautiful. The water is warm and you get random storms and it's so cool. And the people live so they call it Fiji time or island time. You know, you've probably heard that too. It's like, they're like, oh, we're on Fiji time here. And so everything takes longer, but it, it teaches you to slow down and people are running around barefoot everywhere and climbing up trees to get, to get coconuts and food. And, and they, people live in villages. We got to visit an actual village where that put a lot into perspective. Um, so I'd say there, and then I loved Finland. I, I got to go on a cruise around Europe and I don't know, Finland just had, it was just really beautiful. And a lot of Europe is beautiful. And there was something about Again, the people I'm realizing, wow, this is a theme and I'm pretty introverted, but I just, I think it's interesting to see how people live, but um, like the cobblestone streets and the history and it's just really cool. And people have a lot of pride for where they're from. And I, I appreciate that. So those are probably, probably among my top two. Um, I liked Alaska as well. I got to go dog mushing and sledding there, which was really oh, cool. So cool. Yeah, it w- we got on a helicopter ride. And then so you're flying over and you're seeing like these little you know dots all on all, all below you. And then you get closer and you're realizing, oh, my gosh, it's a bunch of dog sleds and people. And we got to do that. And uh, just special experiences like that. So yeah, anyway, I know that was a bit of a tangent, but I just uh, mean you should talk more about that because I want to get more of your insights on where I should go and what you did. Um, but take us back. So you went to the Bahamas. Um, you did your pro debut. Yeah, and I actually got second place in that one, which my, you know, my happiness coach friend Stephanie said, I'm so proud of you. And she said, and I'm so glad you didn't win. She said, because now there's room for you to grow. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's like the most beautiful thing because most people go to these shows to try to win. At the end of the day, you know, you want to perform, you want to, you know, do your best, you want to improve upon your last package. But at the end of the day, most of us want to win. Um, So it was such a great perspective for me to hear that not winning was the best thing for me because now I have room to grow. Now I have things to work on because I had won my first four shows in my age group every time. Um, so that was, it was humbling, but it was also, again, the perfect result. Yes. Um, and so that was in June and my next show is in October. Woo. And it's, um, yeah, it's the Legion's, um, it's oh, the biggest the pro fest. masters show. Yeah, it's the sports fest in Reno. So they say it's the biggest pro masters show in the world is what the website says. So oh, wow. I'm a, little intimidated, a little intimidated by that, but I'm hoping it just means there's lots of age groups, um, which actually blows me away because in the women's bikini, it goes up to 55 plus. Yeah. Um, but men's bodybuilding, I believe there was an 80 plus class, what? which I'm like, oh my gosh, unbelievable. And I think even in women's figure, there was a 65 and up. I so love I'm that. Just, I, I love that. And I'm so excited to just see these people of all ages um, competing and still, you know, taking care of themselves and loving the sport and, you know, staying fit and staying strong um, and disciplined and all that. So I think it'll just be um, as much as competing is always great. I think it'll be a pretty cool event just to attend to. Yeah. Oh, most definitely. I think it's great that you'll get to, I mean, whether it's more classes or bigger classes or whatever, just seeing how you do at a bigger show and continuing to, like your friend said, find room to grow or or grow in new ways and and maybe prove to yourself what you're capable of or things that you didn't even realize. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because it's, 
even humbly in saying you're a professional bikini athlete when you're a master's bikini athlete, because while I can compete in the open class, um, I'm choosing not to. My thought is I need to be able to beat, you know, all the 40 and 50 year olds and even all the 35 year olds before I would even consider competing in the open class because I, I believe the open class starts at either 18 or 20 or I'm not even sure how young they are, but mm -hmm. girls that could be my daughters. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I was actually going to ask you about why you decided to exclusively do the master's divisions when honestly, like your physique is awesome. And I think specifically too, it's like your glute development. It, I think it could stand up next to open classes, maybe not at the same level as you are right now in masters where you're like freaking killing it. But I think like your physique is open level as well. And obviously with more and more growth and proving to yourself of what you're capable of with the master's divisions, I think it'd be awesome if you did an open division show, that'd be cool. Well, you're so sweet to say that. Um, I think I just need to get more comfortable on stage. I need to get better at my routine. I definitely need to continue to grow my glutes, my legs, my shoulders, you know, pretty much everything that yep. <laughs> girls need to grow, right? Um, yep. Smaller waist, all that stuff. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, right now my goal is to still be doing this when I'm 60. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's realistic or not, but that's kind of what that's kind of in my mind right now. Um, so maybe sometime in the next few years, but I, I think the older I get, the less likely I am to, to compete in the open, in the open class. I just love your mindset being, you just want to do this for a long time, like setting aside, I guess, divisions and placements and all that you love this. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I love the lifestyle. Um, I love going to the gym every day. I love eating clean. I love, you know, sleeping well every night and taking supplements and then, you know, a huge part of it for me too, is just setting a good example for my family. Um, you know, since I started bodybuilding, my 15 year old son has really gotten interested in lifting weights. Um, my 13 year old daughter, who's, you know, she's a volleyball athlete, but she drinks protein shakes now every day. And so, wow. you know, she'll do a kitty pose and say, mom, look, my glutes are bigger than yours. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, honey. <laughs> but, um, it's, you know, instead of, instead of worrying about, as, as I know many moms of teens do, you know, are you too skinny? Are you too fat? You know, all those conversations that, that might happen. Um, in our family, it's all about who's the strongest, you know, who's got the best muscles, who's the strongest, who ate the most protein today? Um, you know, who worked out, you know, it's just a, it's a different focus and I, it's, it's a healthy, fun focus. I always appreciate hearing mom's perspective on how they bring the sport in a healthy way into their family, because so many people either stigmatize or, or don't see this. And there are, there are, and can be some extremes to this sport too. So I love how the conversations you're having are healthy conversations, like about celebrating strength and celebrating nutrition and celebrating taking care of your body rather than just I'm changing it to look this way. And, and that's what determines everything. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and they tease me. They're like, mom, you're eating sweet potatoes again. Do you do anything <laughs> other than work out and eat? <laughs> you know? um, so it's, it's kind of, it's pretty comical, but um, yeah. And, and, you know, they see me get lean for a show, but they know it's just for a week or two and then I'll be back to normal in a short amount of time. And, and they see how much effort goes into building muscle you know, cause I'm at the gym hour and a half, two hours every day. And I'm not a giant woman, you know, and they see, yeah. they see the work that goes into it and that, wow, it takes a lot of effort to build muscle. Um, which again, my son is a 15 year old thinks he should just be, you know, a bodybuilder overnight. Like, no, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't work that way. Um, while you have, some, um, yeah, you, you know, you're in the best position you'll ever be in because when you're a new yes. weightlifter, that's when you see the biggest gains plus you're a teenager you're going through puberty you know you've got everything going for you um so he has seen some nice gains in a short amount of time um but yeah it's uh it's a good it's a good reality check for everybody I think definitely that's what I love about bodybuilding too is it really teaches patience in a world that is so um, rushed I don't want to say impatient because it's not maybe that's not the right 
way of describing the world, but I think a lot of people feel rushed and pressure and everything's got to be achieved right now. And bodybuilding is like every time a reality check slow down, you know, you gotta, you gotta trust this process and it doesn't just happen overnight for anybody. Right. Well, and it's funny because when I do sometimes think, Oh, do I want to keep doing this? Like, do I need a coach in my off season? Like, you know, those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. I always come back to, well, I'll never know the progress I could have had if I do take a break or if I don't have a coach, like why, why would I give up those things when I know those are the, you know, the best way to get the results that I'm looking for. Definitely. Yeah. I think like there's, there's times when I personally, like, I don't want to be coached. I just need like a couple months to do my own thing, but it's pretty much still the same thing, you know, that I was doing. It's just out of my own uh, programming. And then every time I'm back with my coach or I'm working with him, I'm like, Oh yes, I love this. You know, it's, it is true. And you never want to feel like you missed out on anything, whether that's on doing the best you could before stepping on stage or making the most gains you could have in your previous season. And I think every competitor could probably say that they've questioned like, am I big enough? Have I put on enough muscle? Like, and then you start your prep and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't put on enough enough muscle because you look flat or (laughs) whatever, you know, you're in those awkward stages. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The body struggle. But I want to talk to you then because you said that in, after your first show, your first show, you had taken like a year off and you missed it or eight months off and you missed it. What was happening in that time frame that was maybe different than prepping because you said you want it you missed having the carrot in front of you you missed having a reason to do this so what changed in your life when when you went into that first improvement season yeah um oh that's a good question so yeah again I think I think my my goal could have been better so instead of saying just get in the best shape of my life I should have say it said get in the best shape of my life and figure out how to stay there yeah. Um, and I'm not talking about stage lean. I just mean strong and fit and muscular. Um, and I kept kind of doing the training that I had been doing and I had, you know, loosely stuck to, um, a meal plan or a macro plan, but it, it just wasn't the same. It just didn't feel the same without a coach and, um, without, without a show to look forward to. And it's funny to, to even say to look forward to, cause I can't say I look forward to the shows, but I guess, I guess I do. Um, it, just having that goal out there, having, you know, something to work toward for me, I guess is, is pretty motivating. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, I kind of did the same thing that whole year, but with, with less purpose, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Like there, it wasn't for a show. It was still your lifestyle, but it just looked different. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, I love that you love this. And that was clear when you came to the event and you were really talking about how much you enjoy your programming. And I think that is awesome because you really do practice what you preach with your nutrition, with your health. You said that you love that you're getting those good nights sleep. You love that you're getting to train and eat. Did you have to make dramatic changes in your lifestyle when you started, cause you said it was a bit more than you bargained for. Um, so I'm curious, like what had to change from before you decided to commit to working with Adam for those five months to after. Yeah. Um, it was a huge change nutrition wise. Um, I think I thought I knew what healthy eating was and I was either choosing to eat healthy or not, you know, on a meal by meal, day by day basis but I was a huge sweet tooth. I mean, my favorite foods were just all the sweet junky carbs, you know, pancakes and French toast and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bagels and, you know, just lots of gluten, lots of sugar, lots of, I'm going to say not real nutrient dense carbs. Like that's just what I loved. Um, And what I didn't realize is that was also making me always feel kind of sluggish and always feel kind of tired and always feel kind of, ugh. Um, so it really wasn't until I started, you know, getting rid of some of that and having healthier foods. I mean, I still eat a ton of carbs, but now it's rice and sweet potatoes and quinoa and oats and, you know, things that make you feel good. Um, I just, I didn't realize how much energy I could have until I cleaned up my diet. So it was a huge shock. 
and I had done different diets before, you know, I'd tried the whole 30 before, which is, you know, basically a sugar detox. Um, and I'd done other things, but this was the first, what I'm going to call, and I don't, I don't like to call it a diet because it, for me, again, it's a lifestyle now, but it was mm-hmm. the first time that I felt like I was eating healthy and I could sustain it forever. Um, because I wasn't hungry. I felt great. I was getting enough food. I knew it was the right foods. Um, yet I was still changing my shape, um, to be less fat and more muscular. That's awesome. Yeah. I want to highlight how you said that you paid attention to how it changed, how you felt, and also that it was feeling sustainable because it wasn't like you were starving or, or dying for food or anything like that. But I like that you focused on how it was nourishment for your body and not like, Oh, I miss all these foods that, you know, maybe emotionally or mentally were stimulating. And, and instead it was, wow, actually these foods over here, it doesn't mean personally, I don't believe it doesn't mean the other ones are bad. It, It just means that these ones made me function at a higher level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, and I didn't know I felt bad until I got rid of those foods and started feeling really good. And I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) And it's, it's funny because I still, you know, I still make my kids peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and mac and cheese and, you know, they're kids, they need a lot of carbs and they're lean. They can eat whatever they want. Um, you know, I make sure they get protein, but I've also always been the mom who, and this was kind of a risky strategy But I said, you know what, I'm going to have the junk food pantry because I want my kids' friends to come here. And if they know that, you know, there's a trampoline in the backyard and a pantry full of treats, um, they're more likely to come here and go instead of go to other people's houses. And so then I'll get to know their friends and they'll be around more. And the risk, of course, is that my kids eat junk food all day or that my husband and I eat junk food all day. But the, the converse happened. My kids see junk food in the pantry and they're like, eh, that's always there. We don't care. Mm -hmm. What's new? What'd you buy at the grocery store today? And they don't eat it. But then when their friends come over, they're like, you guys have the best treats ever. (laughs) You know, this is is fun. This is so great. And I'm sure their moms don't like me, but um, (laughs) no. So yeah, it's, it's funny how you can have, you know, I know a lot of people who try to eat clean just eliminate all those foods from their house, from their refrigerator, from their pantry, from everything. So they have no temptation. Well, to me, that's not really reality. I mean, there's always no. temptations. In life. There's always going to be something good on the menu or, you know, a dessert or, you know, a treat. So for me, it was more about being able to have them around and just learning how to either not have them or have them in, you know, moderation. Yeah, exactly. This is super aligned with what I believe about like normalizing all foods. And so often people think, oh, I need to go and and cut out all of this food or get rid of it all. And it's like, well, what then happens when you're post-show, you're back, or let's say you're immediately post-show, you're backstage and now there's cookies all around and there's cake on the table. Like, what are we going to do with that? If you've not ever been exposed to it and proven to yourself that Eh, it's not really a big deal. You know, you can say no. And that's where I think people just need to change how they're thinking about food and their relationship to it, of course, and and how they are viewing it comes down to what are their beliefs about it in the first place. Absolutely. And I like the whole thinking of, is this going to help me reach my goals or not? Mm -hmm. Um, and, And it can be with food. It can be with going out. It can be with an activity. It can be with whatever. Um, but just asking myself that question is, is this helping me reach my goals, whatever they might be? Yeah. Whatever they might be is the key there. It's like, okay, your goal could be, um, to socialize and have fun with the people around you. And you kind of realize, well, food doesn't necessarily have anything to do with it, but if I can enjoy, let's say a couple of chips and salsa and get a meal that makes me feel really good, I'll enjoy the whole entire night and I'll have the energy to sustain great conversation and, and just looking at food, not so much as this is going to make my body look this way or that way. And instead seeing it as how's this going to support me in what I'm trying to accomplish, whether it's at this dinner situation or for the next 20 years of my life. Yep, exactly. So you know that some, and you're a coach yourself. And when I say yourself, I I don't coach people in their nutrition and, and fitness anymore, but 
I understand what it's like to work with people. And some people do struggle with meal plans and meal prep. So how have you made it easy for yourself as well as enjoyable with consideration for the fact that you have kids as well? Yeah, um, we definitely eat different things. <laughs> um, yeah, it's that's that's probably the that's probably the, what I like. If I ask my husband what what do you like least about bodybuilding, and he'd probably say, well, that we rarely sit down for a family dinner and all eat the same meal. Mm. Which you know, he's from South Dakota, where you have supper. Which yeah, is like supper. But you have supper together at the same time every night at the same table with the same family and everyone eats the same thing. And that's just, you know, how, how it was. Um, Well, the reality is my kids are off at different sports and finish school at different times and, you know, different friends and activities. And the likelihood of us sitting down for a family dinner more than once or twice a week is, is slim to none anyway, which is a little sad, but it's just reality. Um, and we, and the truth is we all just eat different things and my kids come home from school starving. So they want to eat the second they walk in the door at four o'clock. Um, and they don't want to wait till my husband gets home from work at six. So I guess we, we definitely eat different things. Um, you know, I try to cook for them. I don't love to cook. So that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother piece of it. Um, yeah. And my kids, they, I guess, it's made them more independent. Um, they'll definitely fend for themselves more often than not. And, and that's been a fun change too. Again, they're teenagers. They should learn how to cook. Um, but some of the choices that they're making now too, whereas like maybe a year or two ago, if they had, if they're on their own for dinner, they might have a bowl of cereal. Um, now my daughter's much more likely to saute up, you know, some frozen shrimp or my son will make protein pasta or something like that. So um, yeah, the whole family meal dynamics is, is definitely an interesting one. Wow. Well, were you guys eating supper together before you started competing? I would say we were more regularly. Yeah. And I think part of it has to do with their age and activities. You know, now that they're older, um, a lot of their sports are in the evenings. So they kind of have to come home from school, eat, and then rush off to their sport. Um, whereas when they were younger, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. So it was easier. So part of it is just situational anyway, but yes, I would say we did used to eat family dinners more regularly <laughs> before I got into this crazy world. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess there's, it is really a give and take. And I, I remember there were times when I think my family felt that way when I got into competing, like, oh, you're eating that. You're not eating this or what your mom made or, you know, what everybody else is having or you're not going out to eat to have this. And and there were times when I was like, can we do other things together? You know, like, can can we do other things that don't involve food so that I can enjoy this time or you guys feel like I am? And and I'd always say, I'm still eating. And my mom always had my back. She's like, she's still eating with us. It's just not the same food. And I think that it's important to recognize that with competing, like changes do happen to your life. Um, and, and they evolve too throughout competing. And this is something now that you recognize you want to do for years and years to come. So what do you foresee the future looking like? Do you think it's going to be very similar to how it looks now for you? Or do you think it will continue to change? Um, you know, I think just the second you think everything's going to stay the same, it all changes. So I definitely <laughs> anticipate change. Um, I don't know what that'll look like. Um, in terms of, you know, training and nutrition, I, I'd love for it to stay similar to how it is now because it, it works for me. Um, I always get my workouts done. I like to be done before noon. Um, and you know, again, that the meal plan now is, is so routine. It's so easy. I don't even really have to think about it. I mean, I have my huge list of foods that I can choose from and really all that changes is the macros, um, depending on if I'm in improvement season or if I'm in prep, um, and my preps are pretty easy. So I'm five weeks out and I haven't even started cutting my calories yet. I'm expecting nice. those to get cut. Yeah, I'm expecting them to get cut here pretty soon. <laughs> um, that's another thing I like about Adam. Like he definitely promotes staying lean in the off season just because it's a lot easier to stay lean than it is to gain a bunch of weight and then get lean again. 
Um, and that, that works for me too, because it, it is, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to gain a bunch of weight in the off season and lose a bunch of weight and then gain a bunch of weight. Like, I feel like that's, you know, in my previous life, um, you know, in high school or college, I did a lot of the yo-yo dieting um, and it just didn't feel good for me. So I've found a place where it's, it's comfortable, it's sustainable, it's easy, um, and just kind of try to stay within that 10% of stage weight. Definitely. Okay. And that works for you. And that's, you know, then that helps you to have an easier prep. And right now you're experiencing the value and the benefit of that, which is awesome. And I'm glad you shared a little bit about what a day usually looks like for you. Cause I'm always curious what people's days look like. So you said that you usually are done with your workouts and everything by noon. Yeah. So I would say I'm up every day by 6am. Um, I kind of get myself ready for the day. I help my son get out the door. Um, then once he leaves and my daughter <laughs> get her up and out the door, um, they're on their schools are totally different schedules and his school is like 40 minutes away. So it's, oh, you know, wow. it's carpool. yeah, it's crazy. Um, and then I get to the gym and I probably socialize a little more than I should at the gym, which <laughs> is why I'm there for so long. But then the afternoon just usually is, you know, it, it varies by the day, but, you know, silly stuff, grocery shopping or food prep or clean the house, laundry, you know, just mom duties. Um, and the next thing, you know, I'm picking them up from school and um, in the evenings, again, my daughter does volleyball and my son does lacrosse. So it's, I'd say probably five nights a week. Um, I'm a chauffeur because nobody's quite 16 yet. So do a lot of, a lot of driving, a lot of carpooling, um, you know, in, in my free time, maybe a little vacation planning, you know, where are we going to go next kind of thing? Um, yeah. And then a husband too. He's, he's in the picture. He's wonderful. Okay. He's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, works, he, he's an architect and, um, always worked hundred percent from a, a downtown office. Didn't oh. think he ever could. Yeah. Never thought he would want to work from home, but obviously COVID changed that for everybody. Um, and now he actually works from home a couple days a week and loves it. That's so awesome. that's fun. So, yeah. So on the days where he's home, we'll take the dogs for a walk in the afternoon. And, um, you know, you mentioned I was in, in sales for 23 years. And, uh, so I went pretty hard for those 23 years, um, mm -hmm. traveling probably weeks a month. Um, and so now it, this is, I would say this is my first year of what I'm going to say is retirement um, without COVID because I got laid off right, you know, basically Thanksgiving right before COVID hit. So it was layoff and then holidays and then COVID. And it was actually a, a blessing in disguise. I was kind of, kind of uh, done with that career. It had, it had run its course. Um, but to, to be home and not have the stress of work during COVID um, was kind of nice. But then you know, I hadn't had the reality of what's it going to be like when it's just me home alone, retired, and my husband's back at work and my kids are back at school. And that really just started last month. So wow. now it's kind of figuring, yeah, it's kind of figuring out what's next for me. Do you have any ideas other than your business? Well, I guess that's a good segue. Um, <laughs> so I guess it was only about a year ago you know, I, I love this training and nutrition stuff. And something I had also done was made it a point to, to try to learn one thing new every single day, whether it was listening to a podcast or just reading or um, researching or whatever, something new about training your nutrition every day, whether it was a new exercise, you know, just something. Um, and so then I realized after a while, I'm like, I have all this knowledge and I want to share it. Um, and my sister had some weight to lose. So I reached out to her and said, Hey, what would you think about if I gave you a nutrition and a training program um, for free? And you would do weekly check-ins and this and that. And she's like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and I was like, okay, then. And it was actually a great learning though. And it made me realize I'm like, people aren't going to change because someone else tells them to people are only going to change when they're ready. Yeah. And so yeah, it was, and I actually kind of felt bad. I'm like, oh, I guess I was telling her she needed to be different than she was today. And so I actually felt bad and apologized about that. But a few months later, she called me back and she said, okay, I'm ready. And I said, are you really ready? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, so I'm going to put a lot of time and energy into this 
nutrition and training for you. And all I ask is that you commit and, you know, play a hundred percent. She said, I'm in. Um, so fast forward six months later, she had lost 30 pounds. That's awesome. And yeah, it was feeling amazing. And again, same thing, like slow, steady weight loss and sustainable, um, working out more than she ever had before, but not excessively, you know, it's not, it's not bodybuilding training. It's just, Hey, let's, let's lift weights three days a week and do cardio a couple times a week. Um, and so then I thought, well, could I expand upon this and help other women, um, you know, basically eat clean, train for results and get their bodies back are kind of the, the focuses that I have. Um, and so, yeah, so since then I've probably had about 30 different clients. Um, and wow. this is just since the beginning of the year. Yeah. And, um, you know, varying degrees of success, as you know, they say that 95% of diets fail. Um, and I think it's because people think they're diets. It's yes. like, this can't be, a, it has to be a lifestyle change. This has to be a permanent mindset change. Like you don't get permanent results from temporary changes. So if you make permanent changes, you get permanent results, temporary changes, temporary results. So the people who actually, you know, stick to the plan and continue to do it have been wildly successful. And then no surprise, the ones who don't, don't and aren't. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's been fun. And it's that's just more of something that I'm doing on the side, um, mostly because I just love to see people um, succeed. And reach, and reach their goals. And again, it's not about contest prep. It's not about bodybuilding. It's more about, I know a lot of people put on unwanted pounds during COVID. Um, so it's kind of just a, hey, let's reset and see if we can get you back to a healthy place where you feel good about yourself. Yeah, I think that that majority of Americans put on 30 pounds. Which is crazy. It's crazy. I, I mean, I understand. When, when people are not leaving their house and they're not getting out and they're not getting steps in and the gyms were all closed and um, comfort food and depression. And, you know, there's so many challenges that it's, it's crazy, but it's not surprising. No. And no, I, my mind's telling me don't go where you want to Celeste. So I'm not going to, but I think being stuck at home causes lots of challenges for many reasons, like you were saying, it's mental, it's physical, it's emotional. And uh, how can somebody who is stuck at home, not exposed to, or not having other resources available, be able to change their lifestyle? And if health is so important, you would think that would have been emphasized, but it hasn't been. So it's good that we have people like you who are emphasizing it. I know I released a workshop on overcoming the mindless eating. I still have it actually. If you guys are listening, it's on celestial.fit slash snacking shameless plug there because it's really good. Um, but you know, during, during this, uh, time people gain weight, people struggle with their emotions, with their mental health. And it's good now that someone like you, and there's, there's people out there who want to help and are saying, you can turn this around, you know, we're not a lost cause. And I, I think a lot of people think that it's too late to do a lot of things, whether that's get in shape or start a business, write a book, travel, focus on personal development, compete among many other things. But when you decided it wasn't too late for yourself, I can imagine that this required a mindset shift. And I know you have a history of commitment and interest in the personal development world, and you had got your degree in psychology before your MBA. So what did you focus on to become this version of yourself now who not only believes it's not too late, but also goes after the things that she wants and believes in? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I guess <laughs> I wasn't so confident at the very beginning. And I say that because when I decided to do my very first prep, which I didn't even know it was called prep, but when I decided to do that first five months, I didn't tell anybody. I, I only told my immediate family, meaning my husband and my kids. I did not tell my brothers, my sisters, my parents, friends, anyone. And I think it was because I just, I didn't want to hear their feedback. I didn't want the comments. I didn't want the opinions. I didn't want the judgment. I was doing this for myself, by myself, for myself. And um, it just made it easier to just keep this secret to myself. Um, and yeah, I got questions, you know, when I go out with friends, why aren't you drinking? I'm like, eh, just don't feel like it tonight. 
or, you know, why aren't you having the cake? I'm like, oh, just doesn't look good or I'm not hungry. Um, and so when I actually went and did a show, everyone's like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and I think success breeds confidence. Yes. Um, so when I had the success from the first show, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. I'm not too old. I can, I can get up on stage in the bikini. I can put on muscle. I can get leaner. Um, all the things that I think as we get older, we start to question, um, am I too old for this? You know, am I just stuck with this baggy mom bod because I have two teenagers now and it's been, you know, it's been a long time since I was as fit as I wanted to be. And I just, I was not okay with that thinking. Um, in fact, my, my promise to my kids and who knows if I'll be able to keep it or not is to make it to a hundred. And I tell them that I'm only halfway and that the second half is going to be even better than the first half. Um, and that you can do anything, that you can start a business, that you can become a bodybuilder, you can write a book, you can travel the world, you can really do anything that you want to do. Um, you just have to work hard and put in the effort. Wow, amazing. I, I, I love what you just said and your confidence and conviction in saying it. And, and you're totally right that the more we achieve and accomplish things, the more we prove to ourselves we can. And then I think we gain that confidence to set more and more goals. And I love how you said you told your kids you're going to make it to a hundred. So what are some of the key things that you do every day that support you on a mental level that you think will get you there? Oh gosh. Um, for a while I was really good at journaling in the morning. I need to get back to that. Um, the five, <laughs> Five minute journal, I'm sure you've heard of that, where you write your intentions for the day, things that will set your day up for success, things you hope to accomplish. Um, and then at the end of the day, you, you know, kind of go back and which of those did I succeed at, which do I still need to work on type of thing. So I've done a lot of that in the past. Um, honestly, I think it's just your, your mood is always a choice. And I feel like this life is such a gift that every day, no matter how you feel when you wake up, um, it's a choice. And I feel like if I want my kids to be energetic and enthusiastic and cheerful and outgoing and make eye contact and, you know, be good people in this world that I have to set that example for them. Um, so I think a big part of it is just being a good example for my kids. Um, another one is showing up um, as a good mom, showing, showing up as a good wife, um, showing up as a good friend. Um, and then doing things for others, you know, it's, it, while I say it's a business, um, I'm not making any money doing the, <laughs> the coaching and uh, nutrition stuff. And it's mostly because I just put so much time into it because I love it. Um, you know, I, I send out little blurbs, little inspirational quotes and check in with people way more frequently than I need to. Um, because for me, the, the motivation piece um, keeping them motivated, keeping them excited, keeping them on track, um, and helping them stay focused and stay positive is what's so fun. That's awesome. I think yeah. it's really special that you're so motivated to be an example, um, for your clients, as well as for your kids, especially. So do you think that having kids has motivated you more and, and knowing that your kids are watching and, and changing because of you motivates you more every day? Or do you think you would find other things to motivate you if not for your kids? Um, I definitely think I would find other things to motivate me if it wasn't for them, but it's been, it's been so rewarding to see how they respond um, that they're definitely, you know, top, top of my motivation for sure. Cool. You know, just, uh, just so they know that they can do anything they want to do that, um, whether it's, you know, business or whether it's fitness or whether it's sports or, you know, music, whatever it is, um, that you're never too old. It's never too late to try something new. Um, and it's okay to fail. Um, that's a big thing that I, that I try to teach them and that, that failure, you either win or you learn is what I tell them. Um, when you win, it's great because that means everything went your way, but that's not life. You don't always win. Um, and when you don't win is when you learn and when you learn is when you grow. Um, so again, you know, in their sports, they obviously deal with disappointment and 
wins and losses and teammates and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, just trying to make them the best little people that I can. Um, is I feel like that's my job right now. That's awesome. I really yeah. love that. Oh, thanks. Of course. And and you had played sports growing up as well. So do you feel like your experiences as an athlete when you were younger is contributing or has contributed to your experiences in bodybuilding? Yeah, um, for sure. My my love <laughs> was gymnastics, but I was not built for gymnastics. I mean, gymnasts are tiny little powerhouses with you know lots of muscle and they're typically, you know, five feet tall. I mean, to be a, to be a top gymnast and I'm obviously not that build, um, but I loved gymnastics and um, I also played soccer. I played volleyball. I played softball, just tons of sports. And then, you know, before bodybuilding, I had tried CrossFit. I had done Orange Theory. I did a lot of yoga. So yes, I think um, I've always done some type of activity, some type of sports in my life. And um, I think it just, more than anything, it makes you feel good. And when you feel good, you're happier. And when you feel good, you want to make other people feel good. And um, yeah, I'm just a huge proponent of just physical activity. Um, Yeah, just being active, being fit, being healthy, just makes you feel good. Yeah, that's awesome. You've certainly accomplished a lot and, and also you have continued to accomplish your goals and, and achieve things that I think other people would dream of achieving and want to achieve. So um, I want to, I always love to wrap up the episodes with getting your best advice and you've left us with a lot of good information, but why don't you tell us what your best advice is for someone who has never competed before, but would like to, and then your best advice for someone who's on their road to pro. Oh, good one. So my best advice for someone who hasn't competed, but wants to, um, I would say a hundred percent hire a coach. I would have been completely lost without a coach. Um, and do your research, make sure you're hiring a coach that is experienced, um, and their beliefs align with your beliefs, beliefs, you know, um, some coaches do meal plans, some coaches do macro plans. They're both great, but you might prefer one over the other. So make sure that they prescribe something that you're going to like. And if you don't know, cause you're new, then, you know, do some research on that. Um, I think one thing that's tricky, and this is whether you're amateur or pro is social media. And, you know, I use social media to inspire and um, motivate myself like looking at some of the top pros, like watching their routines, um, seeing how muscular they are. But at the same time, if you, if you don't do it with the right mindset, it can actually be demotivating. Um, like for me in particular, again, I struggled to put on a lot of muscle. So I see the bikini pros getting really muscular and I'm like, well, is this really for me? Like, can I get as big and as muscular as the division is trending these days? Um, and then I need to take a step back and say, okay, they're the top pros in the world. That's not me. Um, they're my motivation. They're my inspiration, but that's not me. And you can't compare yourself. Um, as long as you are growing and as long as you are better than you were yesterday, then I think you can consider that to be success. Um, and then for someone trying to go pro, um, Honest to God, I feel like I just got lucky. I feel like I just, I showed up on the right day at the right time, at the right place. Um, I, again, got lucky with the right coach for me. Um, And all the stars just happened to align that day. I don't think that's common. And I realize that now. Um, I know some phenomenal girls with phenomenal physiques that have been to, you know, four or five national shows this year alone. And you would look at them and say, they should all be pro. Um, and why aren't they winning? And there's no good answer. And, you know, it's only because there's one or two. And so my advice to someone that wants to go pro is don't give up. Um, keep, keep putting in the work. Um, just believe that your day will come. The stars will align for you one day. Um, but it could be weeks. It could be months. It could be years. Um, as we talked about earlier, it's a slow process. It's definitely a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so just if if you love it, do it for the pleasure of the sport, 
um, do it for the process and the daily routine and the lifestyle, not just for that one uh, shiny moment on stage. Yes, I love that advice, Holly. Thank you so much for sharing that. And of course, I want people to be able to find you and maybe follow your journey even more or potentially work with you. So can you let everybody know how they can do that? Oh, sure. Um, I'm 51. So, you know, I'm not a huge Instagrammer, um, (laughs) but I do have an Instagram. It's at Holly, H-O-L-L-Y, fit at 50 and 50 is spelled out. So H-O-L-L-Y, F-I-T at um, and the ad is spelled out F I F T Y at Holly fit at 50. Um, and then I also have my website, which is Hollyistic, and that's a play on holistic, but hollyisticnutrition.com, just like it sounds. Awesome. Um, and I'll make sure to put that in the show notes so that people can click it or find it as well. Oh, great. Yeah. And to those of you listening, I always put show notes with the links and their Instagrams and websites, et cetera, on celestial.fit slash podcast. That's where you can also find the timestamps for not just this episode, but every episode and summaries. So definitely make sure you check that out. If you're looking for maybe specific episodes or you're looking for pieces and parts of this episode that you want to go back to, uh, you can do that on celestial.fit slash podcast. Scroll down to the category section to find Holly's name. If you're listening to this in the future, if you're listening to it right away, it'll be at the top of the page. So appreciate you guys tuning in and Holly, thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much. It was a pleasure not just to talk to you today, but also meeting you in person. That was awesome as well. Oh, thank you so much, Celeste. I definitely look forward to working with you in the future and attending more of your events. It was, yeah. it was um... <laughs> I would love to have you. That would be awesome. I'll be back for sure. Yay. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever you are in the world while you're listening to this episode.